Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to uh, this briefing this morning. Uh, Pleased to participate. It's a very timely Helsinki Commission briefing and learn firsthand from experts about the upcoming elections in Tunisia and the process of political transition undertaken since the revolution that shook not only Tunisia but the entire region. The Arab Spring started there, uh, continues in, in, in northern Africa. And uh, all from one person standing up in his own way, speaking truth to power. A very difficult way to do it, but it was an effective way. And the whole northern Africa world changed. Our discussions this morning will also be very helpful in my capacity to be as an observer of these elections on October 23 Sunday in conjunction with the election observation mission of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Organization for Security Cooperation Europe, um, better known as OC, OSCE. The first elections following the overthrow of longtime, longtime <coughs> President Zan El Abid ben, ben Ali, Tunisians will cast their ballots for a transitional national constitution of assembly, which will be charged with drafting a new constitution and preparing for presidential and parliamentary elections. More than 100 parties, most of them newly created, along with independents are competing for 218 seats in this uh, constitutional assembly. Ben Ali's departure was greeted by widespread euphoria within Asia, Tunisia, excuse me, within Tunisia. However, disputes over reform priorities, political instability, economic crisis, labor unrest, and lingering insecurity are continuing challenges. Uh, the humanitarian impact of refugee flows from Libya presents additional difficulties. Uh, entire Northern Africa area, the economic problems are what gave birth to the spring and will allow this, unfortunately will continue the spring because those problems won't be solved overnight. Despite many political and economic characteristics shared across the region, Tunisia exhibits a number of unique attributes. It has a relatively small territory, a sizable and highly educated middle class, and a long history of encouraging women's socioeconomic freedoms. These factors have led some analysts to state that Tunisia is the best placed country in the region to successfully undergo a democratic transition, and that conversely, if it can't, this could have dark implications for the other countries, such as Egypt and Libya. Today, we'll examine a range of issues impacting the elections and the future of Tunisia and the region, including management and transparency of the electoral process, stability and security before, during, and after the elections, the potential shape of the new political order, and the economic development necessary for long-term stability and the consolidation of democracy. We have an impressive group of experts with us this morning to discuss these critical issues. Steve McInerney is uh, uh, McInerney? McInerney, yeah, and the consonant in there. He's executive director of the Project of, on Middle East Democracy and has more than six years of experience in the Middle East, including graduate studies in Middle Eastern politics, history, and the era. Arabic language at American University of Beirut and the American University in Cairo. He's written extensively on Middle Eastern politics and U.S. foreign policy and appeared on numerous media outlets including BBC, MSNBC, Al Jazeera, and CBS News. He developed an interest in the Middle East while teaching mathematics in Qatar after learning earning an MS in math from Stanford. Uh, Barry Freeman is director for North Africa at the National Democratic Institute. He previously served as NDI Deputy Regional Director for Central and West Africa, where she managed a diverse portfolio of country programs across the region that included support to electoral processes, civil society development, legislative strengthening, and political party development. Prior to joining NDI in 2010, uh, 22, Ms. Freeman spent 15 years with the U.S. State Department working in the political, economic, and consular sections of U.S. embassies in Tunisia, Morocco, uh, and Nigeria. She's the co-author of Transparency and Accountability in Africa's uh, Extractive Industries, the role of the legislature, and has been a contributing writer to Freedom in the World, an annual survey of civil liberties published by Freedom House, graduate of Tulane University, a member of Conference USA, Ms. Freeman completed her master's coursework at Georgetown University. Welcome. Uh, Mohamed Belouch is a founding member and current president of Tunisian American Young Professionals and has been presenting the Tunisia's economic value 
proposition to exporters and investors in the U.S. and leading the development of an entrepreneurship culture in Tunisia through mentorship, technical, and financial support. Mohammed is also, well, at the same time as being a member of the Young Professionals, he's a senior manager. You've got all bases covered. With Deloitte Consulting in the telecom industry in 20, 2002, he founded Promo Tunisia. Uh, services company that offers cultural trips to Tunisia for U.S. travelers and promotes Tunisia as an investment destination in the information and communication technology sector. Currently working with Penn State University and the State Department on a U.S.-Tunisia partnership for the promotion of technology innovation and commercialization strategies in engineering research and education. Uh, Mohammed held an MBA from Telecom Paris South in France and a master's in telecommunications from Michigan State. We will begin with Mr. McInerney. McInerney. Thank you, Congressman, and uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Thank you for holding this uh, event uh, on elections that I think are extremely important, not only uh, for Tunisia, but for the entire region. Uh, and, you know, as you mentioned, of course, Tunisia is where the, the Arab Spring uh, revolution began, and I think the entire region will be watching very closely. Um, to see uh, the outcome of these elections, not just the outcome in terms of which parties uh, are successful, but um, to what degree these elections are viewed as credible um, and as a step towards consolidating uh, Tunisian democracy. Um, I was in Tunisia for two weeks in August, and uh, it's uh, quite an exciting uh, moment there in, in many respects. Uh, I think, in by almost every measure, the uh, progress in Tunisia during this, this transitional period. Um, is further along and, and going more smoothly toward uh, possible tra transition to democracy than in Egypt. There's sort of a natural comparison with Egypt, of course, because you know less than four weeks, uh, or exactly four weeks after Ben Ali stepped down, uh, President Mubarak stepped down in Egypt. Um, since that time, I think we've seen, um, you know, in in Tunisia, uh, we've seen uh, much steadier progress. We've seen uh, political parties mobilizing um, and, and really focusing on these elections, uh, much more so than in Egypt. Uh, we see, uh, we don't see the same kind of heavy-handed interference by the military in Tunisia that, that we see in Egypt. Um, and I would say that these elections, in many respects, uh, are more pivotal, more pivotal, uh, more important to uh, Tunisia's uh, <coughs> transition than the elections in Egypt. Actually, uh, Egypt's upcoming uh, parliamentary elections, the military council will still remain in charge, they'll still be the executive. In Tunisia, you, you, you don't have that. What you have is a relatively weak, uh, sort of technocratic uh, cabinet government that's now in charge that seems genuinely um, to have a priority of getting to these elections and getting a, a legitimate, uh, legitimate elected uh, transitional national uh, constituent, constituent assembly in place. Um, now, I, I will. I, I will add. You know, there are there are some dangers that, that you know there are some risks that, that we should be aware of. Um, expectations in Tunisia are, are quite high, and while the population now is is rather patient, you know, I, I think um, you know, a lot of the economic uh, ills in Tunisia have not been addressed. That unemployment is extremely high, um, but there's there's a sense there's been a sense for several months now that these problems will be addressed after the elections. Um, I think there, there is a risk that the Constituent Assembly after elections will not be able to produce the kind of results that Tunisian people want uh, as quickly as, as the expectations you know, may be. Um, there's also a real possibility of there being uh, gridlock in this Constituent Assembly. Um, the, the electoral law that's set up will very likely result in a, in a a constituent assembly that includes a very large number of parties. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, there are more than 100 parties have been formed in Tunisia this year, um, and you know, there will be dozens of parties represented, most likely, in, in the constituent assembly. Um, while on one hand it's very important that uh, you know many different segments of uh, Tunisia's political society will be represented in this assembly, on the other hand, uh, having so many parties at the table uh, will make uh, you know, progress could make progress difficult and could be difficult to, to reach uh, consensus uh, and, and move forward. Uh, there are also some some ambiguity and some lack of clarity on exactly uh, what the role of the constituent assembly will be. Um, it's clear that this assembly, you know, its, its primary uh, task is will be uh, to write uh, Tunisia's uh, new constitution. 
In addition to that, however, um, they are expected to appoint most likely an interim president, an interim cabinet that will um, guide Tunisia during the next uh, stage of its transition. Um, but there are, are some questions, and in, 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 uh, among many of the Tunisian population, there's, a lot of, uh, there's some lack of clarity on exactly what the steps will be. And there's some disagreement among some of the parties uh, over uh, not only you know, what to make up of such a cabinet, would be, but whether they should even um, take those steps. Uh, the, the role beyond writing the, the, the Constitution, uh, the role of the Constituent Assembly is not um, perfectly well defined uh, legally, so there, be, there could be some questions uh, in that regard. Um, one thing that I think is important is, uh, as, as Americans to recognize, is that there, is, there does seem to be a real consensus in Tunisia among a uh, wide variety of parties, you know, whether uh, secular or Islamist, uh, leftist, uh, liberal parties, um, that they would like to see a stronger relationship with the West and, and a stronger relationship with the United States. Um, I, I think, um, and I think that that's important, um, and that's also different from many of the other Arab countries, including Egypt, where there's lots of resistance and pushback to uh, American support and, and, and relationship with, with, with the United States. Um, I think all actors in Tunisia would like to see um, more support from the United States. Um, I think there, I got a sense when I was in Tunisia that a lot of um, Tunisians sort of feel as though they've been forgotten and sort of abandoned by the international community, that they were the, you know, the first revolution of, of the Arab Spring, but since then, uh, sort of the international attention that they were, and support that they felt like they were promised uh, in January and February, had, the, has sort of been forgotten and that there's been a shift of attention um, as the international community has looked at Libya and Syria and Egypt. Um, and uh, I think it's very important that if these elections uh, go smoothly and are viewed as credible, uh, I think it, it, it's very important to see that, that, that the Tunisians see international support, um, and including from the United States. Um, that, you know, there's also a real need for investment uh, to increase in Tunisia, and I think if there are um, you know, visible, um, there, I think there are lots of steps that the U.S. could take to demonstrate visible support for the transition and confidence in the country after the elections, uh, confidence that hopefully could tra help translate into uh, uh, investor confidence that could help uh, to, you know, turn the uh, Tunisian economy back in the right direction. Uh, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, Tunisia does have um, many, many advantages uh, over many of its neighbors in North Africa in terms of uh, a more highly educated population, uh, a very strong middle class, and sort of uh, an economic fundamentals you know, underlying their economy that are much stronger than any of the other countries in North Africa. Um, however, in the, in the short term, uh, you know, Tunisia is facing uh, you know, an economic uh, crisis that uh, helped uh, bring about the, the revolution um, at the beginning of this year, but it also has been exacerbated by it. Uh, you know, the, um, the investment has, has flooded the country um, due to the instability um, brought about by the, this year's changes. Uh, in addition, uh, tourism has been one of the pillars of, of Tunisia's economy, and uh, their tourist season this summer was, was essentially wiped out as uh, you know, European tourists were you know, watching and cautious and, and reluctant to go to Tunisia as they have in, in the past. Um, I would add also that you, you mentioned the fact that uh, Tunisia is a relatively small country, um, and I think it's important to uh, you know, recognize that in when we have a relatively constrained budget environment here in the United States, that a uh, relatively modest amount of resources and support for Tunisia uh, can have a significant effect. And um, you know, beyond you know, assistance, you know, the administration has been working in different ways to, to um, provide assistance to Tunisia. Um, you know, I think there are many other steps that I could maybe go into in the question and answer period that the U.S. can, can take to, to demonstrate support for these elections. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to other, other speakers. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Ms. Springman. Congressman Cohen, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak today. Um, I've got prepared remarks that have some background, so I'll try to kind of cut as I go along um, so that this is not too long. Um, I think it's important just to note that this election on October 23rd is just one step in what will be a longer term transition process. Um, you know, they, the uh, voters will be going to the polls to elect a 218-member constituent assembly, and as has been noted, the, they'll be responsible for several key tasks um, that, that will, I think, over the long run, shape democratic culture in Tunisia, and that is in drafting the new constitution, 
naming a new government, including a president and prime minister, and putting in place preparations for legislative and presidential elections within one year. Now, some of this is still not clear and could change, I think, on October 24th. No one's quite sure what, will, what, will, what, what Tunisia will look like um, on October 24th. Um, but that said, this is a, a tall order in a country in the midst of unprecedented political change, moving from a tightly controlled authoritarian regime to a multi-party democracy in less than a year. Um, in the months since Ben Ali left power, a political transition took root in Tunisia that has been largely controlled and managed by new institutions with little input from the citizens who drove him from power. The, uh, the upcoming elections will give Tunisians their first opportunity to participate in the democratic process in the polling booth rather than on the streets. Um, and I think the recourse to the streets is also something to, to bear in mind because I think throughout these months when, um, when the public has been angry about something, you know, that's where they go. They don't necessarily go to these transitional institutions. They, they go out on the streets. Um, and public protests led to the resigna resignation of the first two interim governments uh, the current transitional government shifted course in March and deferred to 2012, the plan for the presidential <coughs> elections in favor of elections for a constituent assembly to, to revise the constitution. Newly created institutions took on key roles, including the High Commission for the Fulfillment of the Goals of the Revolution, Political Reform, and Democratic Transition. Um, this High Commission drafted their electoral law based on proportional representation, which is, I think, really intended to send the, send the message that this should be as inclusive an election as possible, um, with stipulations requiring 50-50 gender parity on candidate lists. The list should have to go you know, male, female, male, female. And forbidding key members of the former ruling party from participating in the electoral process. The transitional government created Tunisia's first independent electoral commission, the 16-member Instance Supérieure Indépendante pour les élections. It's known as, everybody just refers to it as EASY. Um, and it's a, a big departure from the past when the Ministry of the Interior ran all aspects of the election. Um, but despite the fact that the EASY has overall responsibility for the process, it is widely suspected with some concern that uh, the Interior Ministry is playing a much larger role behind the scenes and certainly in all the operational aspects of the election. Um, the technical challenges of organizing this election, um, including the need to revise and update voter lists, led to its postponement. It was originally scheduled for July 24th. Um, surprisingly, less than half of the country's eligible voters registered during the voter registration period. Uh, that led the ISI to extend the registration deadline and ultimately to offer voters the opportunity to vote with national ID cards. And I think there's still some questions how that process is going to work on election day. Um, while limited public outreach about the process contributed to the low turnout, citizens' lack of confidence, and long-standing biases against political parties and politicians, a legacy of the corrupt politics of the Ben Ali era, also played a role. Um, I think cognizant of the growing information gap, the ISI has been holding weekly, has held weekly roundtables uh, with civil society groups, political parties, and the media, and they have certainly, in the last weeks strengthened um, their efforts to reach out to voters. And under the umbrella of the of the ISI, the Election Commission, both media and political parties have signed codes of conduct, um, though there are no accompanying enforcement mechanisms. So um, in the months since the transition began, a country that was once ruled by one party now has more than 116. Um, and I think that too, though, is normal in transition processes. Um, I think it's Serbia and their transition. I think they had 400 at one point. Um, but these, but the parties in Tunisia, I think, increasingly can be grouped um, into three categories. They're the center left and the center right parties, which um, include parties that were legal but repressed under under Ben Ali. Um, and those key members, I'm giving the, the alphabet soup, but include the PDP, the CPR, the FDTL, Etajdid, the Democratic Modernist Poll, the UPL, and Afek Tunis. 
the second category are the Islamist parties, which include Ennahda, the country's strongest Islamist movement, which was banned and persecuted under Ben Ali. And then the third category belongs to what are referred to as the Bebe RCDs, and those are the, the baby, the, the sort of remnants of the former ruling party. Um, and those include Al uh, Mubadara and Al Watan. Um, but of this large number, only 66 uh, registered parties submitted candidate lists that were ultimately approved by the IZI. Only five submitted lists in each of the country's 33 electoral constituencies. There are 27 electoral constituencies in Tunisia, with six allocated to diaspora communities around the world. In total, um, the Election Commission approved a to uh, 787 political party lists, 587 independent candidate lists, and 54 coalition lists for a total of about 11,000 candidates, um, which offered voters a bewildering array of choices um, among parties. And many of these parties have had little time to develop distinct identities and party platforms. Um, so I think there's still a lot of there's a lot of worries that there are a lot of there's certainly we know a lot of undecided voters out there and certainly a lot of voters that will have a hard time distinguishing um, in the polling place. Um, and despite that the 50-50 parity provision in the electoral law, ultimately very few women made it to the top of the electoral list. And given that there are so many lists, it's likely that many parties will only get one seat. So the actual representation of, of women in the constituent assembly um, will certainly be much lower. Um, on the eve of the election, public regard for the current transitional government is low. Um, citizens uh, suspect its motives and are particularly angry over its inability to address economic and security concerns. Uh, and these are factors that will also impact <coughs> voter turnout and overall public confidence in the integrity of the process. Strikes and other demonstrations have been common throughout the period and, um, and have raised security concerns for Election Day, and as has the an influx of weapons into the country from the conflict in Libya. In response, the, elect the Electoral Commission is coordinating Election Day security with the Interior and Defense Ministries um, with the, I, the highest priority um, to include ensuring open access to polling stations and secure vote counting procedures, but the effectiveness of this effort has yet to be tested. Um, the importance of religious identity in the upcoming poll and in the broader transition process was most recently illustrated this past weekend by two incidents. Um, on Saturday, there were clashes at a university campus in the city of Sousse over the banning of the wearing of the niqab, or the full face veil. That incident was followed by a protest the next day before a private television station that had screened um, uh, a film uh, that depicts one woman's experience under under religious rule um, following the 1979 uh, revolution in Iran, and it's deemed as being in some places defamatory to, to Islam. Um, and I think these two incidents just, uh, they kind of exemplify this increasingly polarized debate over the role of religion. Um, it's particularly stark because of Tunisia's long uh, background as, as one of the most secular countries in the Arab world. But it, that will surely impact voters' choices on Election Day, um, not only on October 23rd, but in future elections. Um, get out the vote efforts by the Election Commission, the transitional government, by civic groups and political parties are well underway now. Um, you know, I think there's just been a, a there's, there has been recognition that, that citizens are <coughs> feeling confused, angry, people don't really know what this election is about. We did a round of, uh, recent round of focus groups that showed um, well under 50% um, of, the, of, of the respondents even knew that this was what a constituent assembly was. Many people think they're voting for a new president. Um, but I think that you know people hope that just coupled with the excitement of this election that that will ramp up, um, that will ramp up turnout. Um, but I would say that all of these efforts will be in vain if the new constituent assembly does not include public outreach in its strategy to, to rewrite the Constitution and more particularly to oversee governance during this next phase. Um, 
this first Arab Spring election will set the tone for others to come, as we said. Um, and though criticized for many of its decisions, Tunisia's transitional leaders have made efforts to include a wary public in the election process. They've chosen a system of proportional representation that fosters inclusivity. Uh, they've also allowed independent candidates to stand, and they've expanded the voter registration process. Um, these decisions, as I said, may contribute to a lot of confusion and uncertainty on Election Day and in its immediate aftermath. But while this has not been a perfect process, no transition process ever is, I think the, the underlying, the very important message to candidates and voters um, has been very consistent, that the engagement of citizens in this election, um, the first among many for Tunisia, is the most desired outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. And now we recognize uh, Ashurman. Thank you, Congressman, and thank you to the uh, U.S. Helsinki Commission for providing this opportunity to the Diaspora Association to uh, basically provide its perspective and provide its observation on Tunisia's economic and uh, political situation ahead of these uh, historical elections. Um, the Tunisian American Young Professional Association is a nonprofit diaspora group. Uh, that is dedicated primarily uh, at focusing on increasing economic uh, relationship and economic ties between Tunisia and the U.S. Uh, we believe that democracy cannot uh, succeed without economic growth and prosperity. Uh, and we've been actively engaging the private sector uh, between the Tunisia and the United States uh, and also fostering a culture of entrepreneurship uh, in Tunisia as one of the uh, enablers of uh, future job creation and sustainability of job creation. Um, at this critical moment uh, in Tunisia's history, uh, it is our belief that the United States Congress uh, needs to consider supporting the economic growth of what could be the first successful democracy in the Arab world, one that could pave the way to greater freedom in the region, but also greater security here at home. The success of this transition towards democracy goes above and beyond Tunisia and will have impacts in the entire Middle East, North Africa region and the world in the years to come. With a political transition of this magnitude, there's obviously tremendous opportunities but tremendous challenges uh, as well that are ahead of the people of Tunisia. Um, Post-revolution Tunisia is a country that is ripe for rapid development. Uh, the atmosphere has changed, reforms are being accelerated, and people are able to express themselves freely, not only through political activism, but also uh, through social, economic, and humanitarian activities. Besides the 120 political parties that were created, there are also thousands of NGOs, of association, that are uh, contributing to the uh, well-being of Tunisia, which is a really a sign of a vibrant and responsible population interested in shaping its economy, its, its future. Um, in spite of these accomplishments, the concept of democracy and freedom are new to Tunisia, and its political parties, media, and civil society are adjusting to a radically different way of life. Media coverage of Tunisian politics tends to focus on its shortcomings rather than its accomplishments and often exaggerate facts to create sensational stories. There is a growing polarization of the political debate, which is preventing constructive discussions and focuses on ideological conflicts between the left and the right, between the activist youth and technocrats, secularist and Islamist, rather than addressing people real concern such as improved living condition, job creation, freedom, and dignity. As a consequence, the average citizen not seeing much improvement in their everyday life questions the value of this post-revolution environment and are uncertain who to trust in the public sphere. This has translated into relative disinterest in the voting registration process, one measure of many in the Tunisian population's interest in the democratic transition. Right before the official start of the campaign, two weeks ago, a third of Tunisians were still unsure who they were going to vote for. While many are certain who they can oppose, there are few clear choices for most citizens. Many parties have duplicated the platforms of other parties, and it's hard to make informed political choices. The risk is that citizens will make voting decisions based on media perception of candidates as performers, rather than programs and policy that their parties would support. Additionally, 
the extraordinary large number of options is bound to be confusing. Uh, my mother will be voting in the second district of Tunis. She will have the choice between um, basically 80 ballots, um, you know, roughly 53 of them are traced to parties and 30 of them are traced to independents. And, and while I'm confident that she'll be able to sort this out, she, has, she was fortunate to have a, a great education. She's been a math professor for the past 30 years. Uh, you know, I am a, a bit concerned, and uh, certainly that less fortunate people, uh, especially the elderly, will not have that opportunity and may not have the context or the, ed the education to make informed uh, decisions. Despite these challenges to a meaningful adoption of democracy, my hope is obviously that these elections will be fair, <coughs> transparent, and without fraud. Uh, the, act, the outcome of this election is actually known to a certain degree. It's going to be a heterogeneous assembly where no political party can govern or have a majority. Consensus building will be crucial. And in fact, the success of these elections will be measured by the ability of elected officials to effectively collaborate and form coalitions. The leaders of the main parties need to rise above their personal ambitions and move from this chaotic dispersion to a national union based on the interests of Tunisia. They need to move beyond ideological contexts into practical, pragmatic discussion about the political future of Tunisia. This action will send a strong signal that will increase people's trust in their elected officials and encourage the citizen to engage into furthering the political debate. This moment is not only an opportunity for Tunisia, but for the entire uh, region, and Tunisia's responsibility is truly great. Uh, the Tunisian revolution already directly or indirectly uh, led to the swell of change in Egypt, in Libya, in uh, Syria and Yemen, but also in Morocco, where uh, fundamental reforms are being put forward, and Saudi Arabia, <coughs> where women will be eligible as candidates in municipal election for the first time in history. Our organization's belief is that people will continue to lack motivation to nurture the democratic process until the political debate starts moving away from, um, from uh, basically ideology and polarization and until the people begin experiencing some change or some perception of change in their economic daily lives. 2011 has been a year of tremendous change for Tunisia, but it has, it's also been a year of severe economic and job creation slowdown. According to economic prediction, Tunisia needs to achieve an average growth of 6% in order to create a half million jobs in the next three years and reduce the unemployment rate to 10%. It will not be able to achieve this kind of growth without the support of the international community. An ambitious five-year economic plan called the Jasmine Plan was developed by the Tunisian government and submitted to the G8. It consists of short-term social and economic measures to re-establish normal economic activity and a medium-term program consisting of regulatory reforms, infrastructure projects, and the development of a knowledge-based economy that is based on technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. This plan needs the support of the United States Congress to enable the administration to accelerate its assistance to Tunisia by providing loan guarantees to Tunisia's small and medium-sized businesses, launching a Tunisian Enterprise Fund to provide seed money supporting private sector growth, and using its influence over international lending institutions to accelerate financial support. With this kind of help, Tunisia can become a successful example of democracy and prosperity in the Arab world and can give hope to millions in the Middle East North Africa region. This is a historical and unique opportunity. If this revolution does not succeed in Tunisia, it has little chances in other countries that have experienced the Arab Spring. If this revolution succeeds, the impact of its success will have far greater consequences in the region and Tunisia's transition might provide a framework for, for other countries in the region. Ensuring economic stability and growth in these critical months ahead will prove that democracy is possible in a region of the world so dominated by dictators. The political revolution needs to, port, to be supported, but it will not achieve its objective if the economic revolution is not adequately nurtured. 
it is up to Tunisians to make this revolution work, but it's very much in America's interest to see that happen and to be part of a bilateral and multilateral consortium of backers. For a, re for a relatively small investment right now, the U.S. can not only protect its interest in Tunisia's stability, but help realize significant political and economic returns from a wider revolutionary process that is still very much at risk. Thank you again for the opportunity and thank you for the attention. Forward to your questions. Thank you. I want to thank uh, all of our panelists for their uh, being available today and for their comments. I'm, I'm rather a neophyte in this world. I've not spent six years studying the Middle East, having gone to the cutter to do math or a young professional, etc. So I have to ask some basic questions, and one is going to be just what exactly? Maybe you have an idea. The politic and how how are the folks? A, how, how do they determine the constituencies? They try to do it by population and give everybody uh, an equal vote, or is it done by geography and, and how you vote? And, and how, would, how do people campaign? Do they you know, have TV commercials and banners and yard signs? What's going on? So I may not be the best person to that, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Certainly, um, you know, I think, I think what's happening is uh, the, the campaigns uh, are, are in their infancy. You know, both because of relatively, uh, you know, uh, unavailable means, financial means, uh, but also because people just don't feel like uh, they have an established strategy. Uh, and you, so the campaigns are really around educating people on what the constituent assembly is going to do, uh, rather, and, and also signifying sort of some of the key differences that each political party uh, has. Uh, the Constituent Assembly, uh, there's the, the territory of Tunisia has been divided up into circumscriptions. Essentially, there's also circumscription uh, seats that have been awarded to uh, the diaspora, people living outside of Tunisia. Uh, and uh, you know, perhaps you could provide a little bit more technical uh, <laughs> information about that. Uh, but uh, you know, I'd love to focus on also the economic part. That's, I think, where my added value could be. Thank you. Either of y'all can help me a little bit. Give me a picture. I, yeah, um, as far as the electoral districts and the constituencies, um, Tunisia has traditionally been divided into 24 governorates. Um, and those 24 governorates essentially have been translated into electoral districts. Uh, the three, three of the largest governors have been split into two electoral districts. So that gives you a, a, a total of 27 districts in the country. And then there are six uh, electoral districts for Tunisians outside the country. Um, there are there's a governor, uh, sorry, electoral district, uh, for one for Tunisians, or sorry, two districts actually for Tunisians in France, one for Tunisians in Italy, one for Germany, one for the rest of the Arab world, and one for Tunisian expats in the Americas and the rest of Europe. Um, as far as the are those set uh, up by population, or are they just set they, up? They are set up by population. Um, in order, and in, in addition, um, the. Rural governorates, uh, governorates with less than 270,000 people, um, are allocated two additional seats, um, and those between 270,000 and 500,000 people are allocated one additional seat. Um, and and uh, the uh, beyond that, um, they're allocated. Uh, sorry, each seat generally represents 60,000 people. So you basically have, um, you know, each district. The size of the district is basically proportional to the uh, the population. Of the it's, it's, you know, as compared with um, electoral districts in most of the other Arab countries, it's much more um, equitable, you know, it's, it's uh, you, have, you have much less sort of tradition of uh, bringing or gerrymandering of the districts. And, and, you know, it's generally just, uh, perceived to be, uh, a, a, you know, a fairly a, you know, good equitable representation of the population. And Ms. Freeman, can you add anything and tell me a little bit about the politics of it all? How they yeah, I think, again, it goes to this sort of effort to be inclusive. I mean, it's, it's for example, the overseas constituencies, it's not clear that they would last beyond this constituent assembly, but I think what the, the message is that, you know, the many of many of the Tunisians in, in the diaspora are there because they couldn't live under Ben Ali, and so giving them a voice in this constitutional development process is really important. And the same thing as, as, um, as Stephen mentioned about the rural districts, which have been traditionally marginalized, economic development, the politics played out in Tunisia, in Tunis, and along the kind of larger <coughs> coastal centers. Um, so I think this effort to make sure that marginalized people are also have a voice in the, in the constituent assemblies, very important. 
if I may add just one detail, there's a parity conditions in the list, meaning that there's uh, basically equal representation between men and women. You know, there's a man and a woman, a man and a woman, etc. Is there uh, any, what are the, are you, you mentioned that you don't think there's so much issues, it's personality driven actors, kind of like a, something akin to America, I guess. And, uh, but there got to be, are there issues that are people are talking about they want to see guaranteed rights? Is, is there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there's certainly issues that are uh, a bit polarizing issues, obviously. Uh, there are discussions around sort of what type of regime Tunisia will have, uh, sort of a presidential versus semi-presidential versus parliamentary uh, regime. There's um, a lot of uh, discussions around secularism versus Islamism, mm -hmm. whether the constitution needs to have uh, references to Islam. Um, there's, um, you know, discussions around uh, regional development, which has been a, 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 an issue that has been really um, sort of uh, abandoned by uh, the previous regime. You know, the, the Tunisian economics, uh, you know, they, they love to calculate average, but they never look at sort of the, the span and range of, uh, of divide. And so regional development is, is really one of the focus uh, area that has been, uh, uh, that, that is a, a, an area for discussion. But in general, I think, the, the the Tunisian people are moderate. You know they they do not um, you know like uh, excesses or violence. Uh, and th there's a consensus that the future constitution needs to fundamentally have uh, what what differentiates Tunisia, meaning the social advancement of Tunisia, uh, the women rights. You know things that are truly uh, you know making Tunisia pretty unique uh, in the Arab uh, in the Arab world. What's being discussed, if anything, about economic reforms to make sure that there's not a <coughs> concentration of wealth in, 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 in one percent of the population? Yes. So, so that's a very, a very important uh, uh, topic. In fact, uh, with so from a political party standpoint, uh, there's all sort of numbers that you can hear. Uh, unfortunately, you often don't have clear calculations or assumptions or even a way of funding these things. So. You hear uh, numbers that are extraordinary around 15% growth, maybe 1 million jobs. The bottom line is I think the, to date, the uh, most relevant and, and probably most serious uh, plan that I've seen has been the Jasmine plan that was put together by the government. Uh, that is a plan that is completely, it's a five-year plan, it's completely different sort of from the previous plan in the sense that it, uh, it is, first of all, its size, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a basically a hundred million dollar plan over five years. Um, it's focused on regional development, 50 billion uh, dinars, which is roughly 40 billion dollars out of this hundred billion will be dedicated to regional development. Um, the, the concept of transparency, the concepts of rule of law are, and social sort of responsibility are in this plan, which is uh, completely new. Um, and and uh, so, so, so really there's, a, I think, an intense focus on trying to provide uh, equal opportunity to everybody in Tunisia, which was lacking in previous plans. Now, let me ask, you, you mentioned that the former Benalese group are not going to be able to participate. How are you going to determine which individuals are part of this group? And, 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 and do they have, the ones that have not fled, are they trying to organize in any way in this election process? Um, well, there are some former R RCD elements running, and they're in, they're in these parties that are referred to as the baby RCD parties. Um, there was a, a list of key members of the old regime that were banned from politics. There were a number of party lists that were um, submitted and then ultimately rejected by the Election Commission because of some of the names on those lists, although in some cases, those people went to court and were able to overturn the election commission's um, decision. So I think those those elements of the former regime are definitely still out there. Um, maybe not, you know, the leaders, but certainly a lot of rank and file members. Um, and the party, you know, it was very large. It was like the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, where I think a lot of people joined, not necessarily because they had an affinity for the politics, but because this was the way to get jobs, to you know, kind of advance in society. So I think it's kind of a it's a little bit muddy, but I think that that we're going to see 
a lot of protections put in the Constitution to prevent any, you know, one party from, you know, kind of stealing the show again. Mr. McInerney. Yeah, I, would, I would add that there are some you know, former high-ranking members of uh, the Benali regime um, that are, you know, that are not allowed to run as candidates in these elections, but are nonetheless uh, prominently and publicly associated with some of the parties that are running. Um, uh, Ms. Freeman mentioned a, a couple of parties, Al Watan and, and Al Mubadra. Um, they're each sort of, you know, seen as being led by uh, Kalam Bujan and Mohammed Shiram, uh, both of whom were ministers uh, during the Ben Ali government. Uh, neither is running as a candidate himself, but they're sort of the public face of these parties. Um, currently, according to the most recent poll, uh, each of those two parties is polling at about 3%, although there's some some that suspect that they may perform better uh, in the elections than the polls uh, reflect, uh, because some feel that some Tunisians may be reluctant to admit in a poll that they're going to vote uh, for parties that are seen as tied to the old regime, but then when it comes to election day and the privacy of the booth, they might, may do so. Um, but as I just mentioned, uh, you know, even if they perform considerably more than 3%, um, they'll still be you know, a, a minority uh, in, in, the, in the Constituent Assembly, and there's no real risk of them uh, dominating the Assembly. The, the Helsinki Commission had a hearing not long ago about the Coptic Christians from Egypt testifying about the problems they've had, and then of course we saw what happened this recently, uh, difficulties of the Coptic Christians and being a religious minority in Egypt. Are those circumstances at all present in, 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 in Tunisia with uh, issues with the Coptic Christians or are any other uh, religious uh, issues, Islam, the Brotherhood or anything? There, there's not a there's not a significant Christian minority in, in Tunisia. Uh, traditionally, there had, there had been a rather large uh, Jewish population. Um, most of them have immigrated, but there are some that are present. Um, but there doesn't, there are, isn't much uh, you know, current tension uh, with that community. I'd say that the greater concern regarding religious tensions is, uh, you know, among the majority Muslim population. Um, there are many of Muslim heritage uh, that are quite secular, um, uh, include, you know, many that have strong ties to sort of French secularism. Um, and there's a, there are fears of, uh, you know, within the sort of secular leftist liberal communities uh, in Tunisia, uh, there's a lot of uh, fear and suspicion of the, of the Islamists. And see, there's this a big divide. Um, and Nahda, the, the Islamist party, is um, pretty much, you know, the consensus the expectation of the elections is that they will uh, come away with the largest number of seats. Um, but, but, you know, plurality, but certainly not a majority of the seats. Um, and they have taken, you know, I think Anahda recognizes that they're operating in a political society that's very, very secular. Um, they've taken uh, many steps to try to reassure uh, others. Uh, they're sort of aware of the, the fears of them, both within Tunisia and perhaps within the national community in general, fears of Islamists. Um, we were pleased to see earlier this year um, that when uh, it was mentioned this uh, parity and the candidate list for the elections, um, the requirement that all lists uh, alternate between male candidates and female candidates. Um, this is this uh, system was initially proposed by the, uh, the uh, Minister of Women's Affairs. Uh, it was you know, seen as quite a progressive uh, uh, move, and Anahda was actually one of the uh, first parties to, to publicly endorse uh, the system before it was adopted, um, which uh, I think was a step that they tried to take uh, to alleviate some concerns that they would be opposed to women's rights, women's rights. Uh, advancement in Tunisia, or that they might seek to undo some of the, you know, the rights that women were given in the past. Um, nonetheless, despite steps such as this, um, you know, lots of suspicion will remain, I think, um, and you know, until until Nata is in the government and taking part, and um, you know, I think there'll, there'll, there'll be some of these tensions. Ms. Freeman, would you like to be Helen Reddy or Kelly Fisher? Well, I just would note again on the women's parity issue, it's sort of a good news, bad news story because, again, women did not um, make it to the top of very many lists. So with so many parties, it's unlikely you know, that they will have the representation that I think many people had hoped for. Um, but they are at the top of lists on a number of the Inada lists, and I think that's, that's pretty interesting as well. Um, but this religious divide, um, the, you know, I think it's, Anada and Islamist parties were so t horribly persecuted, um, and many of the leaders of Anada spent years in jail. Um, and I think, you know, I think people want to be able to say, look, you know, it's like this, uh, this march at the, this disturbance at this university in Sousa over the weekend. 
you know, people want to say, you know, look, it's our right to be able to be fully veiled or not be veiled. I think that's really, it's, it's, I think it's really more about personal liberties, um, part of this religious debate. Thank you. Do you, would you like to add anything? Well, just briefly to, uh, I think, compliment what has been said there. Uh, there's certainly a, a big divide uh, relative to sort of the role of the Nada and other Islamist uh, movements. Uh, there's perhaps a school of thought that think that, um, that these folks are moderate, uh, that they are uh, going to adopt sort of a Turkish model, uh, that they will also be scrutinized by uh, the Tunisian youth and Tunisian women, especially with, with the use of social media, and that at the end of the day they need to be considered as sort of a you know, like a Christian Democrat uh, type of party. Uh, there's a, a, another uh, certainly conflicting view to that, which uh, states that, um, you know, there's somewhat of a, a double language that is being used uh, in the sense that um, the Islamist and, you know, perhaps one of the, some of the most radical Islamist elements are, um, you know, may not forbid certain things. Um, for example, they, they, they were not going to forbid a woman uh, from wearing whatever she wants. So she, they're not going to impose the veil, but they may bother those women that do not wear it. Uh, similarly, they may not ban alcohol or wine, but they will demonize the people who consume it. And so it's really, you know, sort of, uh, you know, change, a fundamental change is going to happen without seeming that it's going to happen. And so that's, that's one of the concerns, I think, that I'm hearing uh, uh, certainly in, in one segment of the population. What I'd like to add is just one thing is this revolution is not about Islam. This revolution was about freedom and dignity, about job creation, about regional inequalities. And at the end of the day, I, I believe, you know, that's that's what needs to be addressed as well. You know, obviously, you know, we need to draft a constitution. Tunisia needs, you know, a good constitution because without a good constitution, you know, we're, we're, we're doomed. But uh, the, the important thing is that for this, for this government you know, to uh, engage in profound economic reforms and implementation of reforms so that it creates uh, perhaps not the growth immediately, but at least the perception that there are things that are moving. And uh, in order to do that, we absolutely need the help, you know, certainly at the Congress of the administration of the international community. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Malash, on behalf of our chairman, Mr. Smith, the opportunity to ask some questions. Thank you very much, Congressman. Um, on behalf of Chairman Smith uh, and his staff director of the commission, on behalf of the chairman, I'd like to ask a few questions about the, about the Constitution. Um, that, because after all, we're electing an assembly that's going to draft a Constitution. Um, as, as I was listening to the testimony, I, 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 was, I was thinking about uh, one of the most successful experiences we, we, we've had in, 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 in uh, electing assemblies to draft constitutions, and that would be for you know, West Germany in, 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 in 1949. We, we, uh, we were occupying the country, and uh, you know, they had an election that, 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 that uh, elected an assembly that drafted a constitution that's really been enormously successful. And one of the striking things about that is that just despite World War II, which we just fought against Germany, Despite the fact that we were occupying Germany, that, that it was divided, we, we really left Germany enormous freedom and latitude to draft almost whatever kind of constitution they wanted. We we laid down certain parameters, um, um, which were which were not really constricting. You know, it, it had to be democratic. Of course, that's what the Germans wanted anyway. Um, the, the, the only parameter that we laid down that, that they were not necessarily so thrilled with was that we were going to have a, a federal constitution and maybe half the, half the people in Germany wanted one and maybe, maybe half the people wanted a, a centralizing constitution. But uh, so, you know, you know that, that, was, that was a point where, in which we, we got involved in, 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 in drafting that constitution and, and laid down a, a, a single parameter. Uh, as I'm thinking about what's going on in Tunisia, I'm wondering what, what kind of um, what kind of involvement are we are we are we are we getting from the international community? What kind of parameters might might they be laying down? Um, you know, I, I would like to see a constitution in Tunisia that's drafted by by, by Tunisians that comes out of uh, their traditions, uh, their their traditions of legal and constitutional thought. Um, 
this concern that I'm trying to articulate comes out of some some uh, developments I've seen in, in, uh, in European constitutional law uh, that I think are very alarming. I've, I've noted in, in the past couple of, in the past 10 to 15 years that there's a, a tendency in, in, in Europe to separate uh, a constitution from its ratification, a, a, a belief in many of legal circles that a constitution can be drafted by a board of experts and that the fact that it's ratified by the people through whom it's for is really rather secondary. Uh, and and, and uh, you know, the, the, the experts know, know what is needed and, and they can bring a constitution in and the ratification is a, is a formality that, that we arrange. Um, of course, this is totally alien to, to the American way of, of, of thinking in which a people has a constitution for itself, and and uh, and uh, if, if you have to make it your own by being involved in drafting it, and by by, by taking its ratification seriously. So I'm I'm, I'm concerned that that uh, we're, that uh, we don't have a constitution here created for Tunisia by experts, and that all of the negotiation is between uh, you know a Tunisian bloc and uh, a, a group of uh, international uh, legal scholars and mobile constitution drafters who come up with constitutions for various countries. And I, I would like to see this be a process of compromise within Tunisia so that Tunisians feel like this is our constitution. We made it. It, 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 it comes from us, it speaks to us. It wasn't something handed to us. So those are a bunch of uh, factors I'm, I'm throwing out there. I'd like to hear your, your, your thoughts on. Uh, I'd like to throw out one, one other factor, and that is a tendency uh, I know in, in, in uh, European constitutions in the past 15 to 20 years to make the Constitution more than a Constitution, to make it to begin to bring the statute book in, into the Constitution, whereas in America, the Constitution is the you know the rules of the game, but it's not the laws themselves. And in, in, in Europe, recently, we see constitutions coming out that are very, very long that, that, that in effect bring the statute book into the Constitution. This makes it unstable because people want to change laws, but you made it part of the Constitution, which. I think should be just the rules of the road for how laws will be made. So I, I've thrown out a lot here. I, I, I'd like to hear everyone's sort of um, thoughts or reactions or whatever you may see it. That's Mr. McInerney. Um, on, on one of your points uh, about the uh, involvement of sort of international experts, uh, I, I think, the, I expect that we'll see this to a significantly lesser degree in Tunisia than has been the case in, in many other countries. Um, in, in the Arab world, there is now a sort of increased resistance and uh, sort of awareness of this process. And I think the experience in Iraq also has uh, uh, led to sort of resistance of, of outside um, involvement and, and sort of interference in, in this constitutional drafting process. Um, and my impression from the way that I think are now unfolding in Tunisia is that this, this will genuinely be um, a constitution that comes from Tunisians and it comes from internal debates. Um, there are lots of internal debates going on now, uh, not only within Tunisia, but also within all the various parties in Tunisia. Um, I think this, this constituent assembly will involve you know, uh, parties that represent the, you know, the, the entire spectrum of, of Tunisian society. Um, and I think you know, this will you know, result in, in kind of like debates internally on, on most constitutional issues. Um, on your, your point about the, the tendency to make a constitution sort of, in a sense, more than a constitution, I think that is perhaps more of a concern. Um, I, it, it's unclear yet, as of yet, uh, you know what all you know, what the scope of the constitution will be. Um, there's there's some that um, feel as a some parties or groups that may have strong showing in these constituent assembly elections and may feel as though they have more power, um, including some of the parties that um, existed uh, but you know, were limited, but existed during the Benali regime, maybe sort of a head start and that they're, they were better organized and they may be sort of overrepresented in this constituent assembly as compared to their likely representation in the future, that those parties might push for as much as they can in the constitution uh, and sort of push for you know, things that would be you know, better suited to being in, in statute and, and in law, uh, to be enshrined in the constitution uh, to, to protect them because they feel that you know by the time they get to a, a formally elected legislature or parliament, they may have a lesser role. Um, so I think uh, you know, that there'll be some, you know, some sort of struggle between some of those forces and others, uh, and, and you know how that would play out uh, is yet to be seen. Thank you. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, Tunisia's transition has reminded me a little bit of South Africa's. Um, I think that Tunisia's have been in, in 
many instances, including the Election Commission, some of the um, government institutions that have been set up since the revolution, they've been a little bit hands-off reticent to um, to accept or to ask for the kind of foreign assistance that organizations like NDI and IFAS and IRI provide. And I think the message just has been that they know that this, they have to get this right themselves. And that was similar to what the South Africans did. And it, and it has meant some stumbles along the way, but it's also meant things like, you know, they took their calendar. Initially, they were going to just go first. There was great pressure on them to have a presidential election first. They got rid of Ben Ali. They needed a new president. Um, but instead, they went this route for the Constituent Assembly, I think, in recognition that they needed, you know, they needed a legal framework. They needed, they needed that, that um, the rules of the game first. Um, and it's just kind of ironic that the former, the ruling party of, of um, Tunisia's first post-independence uh, president, Habib Bourguiba, was called the Distour Party, which is a constitutional party. So I think there's an attachment and understanding of the significance of, of this document. Um, but I think, again, as, as uh, Mr. McInerney said, I think the concern is that they'll get a really long, complicated document. They are coming out of, you know, heavily influenced by their French traditions. Um, is a concern, and I think the thing that we're really looking at um, in the post-election period, when through our U.S. government-funded program, we'll continue to be working with the parties, some of the parties in the Constituent Assembly, as much as they will allow us, um, and with um, civil society, just to make sure that throughout this process that the link is made between the Constituent Assembly and the public, that they, whether they have some kind of a regular public dialogue or, you know, but just that this process is, is truly an inclusive one. Um, so that's where we'll be going forward. I'm just going to add a couple of thoughts. Um, the, I think there's certainly a strong desire in Tunisia uh, to uh, basically, for Tunisians to own uh, and develop this constitution. Not that there's any uh, sort of trust deficit of any sort, but I think this is an important moment in Tunisia's history and uh, you know, the political forces that are going to make up the Constituent Assembly uh, will want to uh, basically take that responsibility. Uh, the, the, you know, a couple of challenges, however, that could in fact benefit from the support uh, of, uh, of the international community. Um, you know, th there's not a strong tradition of debate uh, in Tunisia, but it's getting there. You know, where, which, in fact, it's normal after 23 years of sort of dictatorship that we don't have that tradition. But um, you know, it, it, it's getting there. I think what's lacking, perhaps, is after the debate, sort of a process to reach a decision. And I think that's where perhaps some of the uh, outside technical support could, uh, uh, you know, could be useful. Uh, the other thing is around your point about sort of involving the people and sort of having, making sure that uh, the constitution at the end of the day reflects the desire of the people rather than perhaps, uh, you know, only the, um, the vision of certain members of the constituent assembly or all of the constituent assembly. You know, I think that's again another area where perhaps uh, some support would be welcomed in terms of sort of participative democracy, in terms of putting together focus groups, in terms of, uh, you know, putting together polling. There's, you know, uh, work that's been developed here specifically by Stanford University around, you know, these, uh, these types of things. Uh, and that could be uh, certainly a tremendous support. I, I have a quick follow-up here. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm imagining, and tell me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm imagining that there are already a number of, of uh, law professors at, 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 at Tunisia's leading universities who understand that, that, that they're going to be advisory bodies to, to, to or advising the, the, the people who are drafting the Constitution. Uh, you know, I imagine they're already thinking and discussing amongst themselves and probably even reaching out to, um, to foreign countries. Do you know what, what their what they're particularly interested in, or what, what, what their orientation is, and if it's if it's very largely to, for, for example, as, as I imagine it might be to French legal positivism, or are they also reaching out to people uh, at at, um, um, at 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 law schools in the U.S. or, or in England, or or, or maybe to into uh, the Muslim legal tradition in in Egypt or elsewhere? Any any thoughts here you have that would be interesting also. Certainly, that they're, they, they look very much to Europe, and, and there's a, a strong cycle. There will be, you know, natural 
experience, as you mentioned. Um, it, there's also um, a lot of, you know, of course, when we mentioned that uh, that is will certainly have a, a prominent role in this assembly, um, and they have a lot of sort of you know, Islamic scholars, and, and I think they they are looking very much actually to Turkey. There's a mention of them sort of. Uh, Possibilities for the Turkish model and the uh, party in, in Turkey. Uh, the, a lot of the you know uh, to, uh, leaders of Anahda and I see some of the smaller Islamist parties as well um, look to Turkey not so much in terms of like Islamic thought, but in terms of practical you know how how do you translate um, your Islamic principles into effective governance and and they um, the they, I think they look much more to Turkey than they do to uh, sort of Islamic scholars in a lot of the, uh, other Arab countries. Uh, I also know that the Da'ak party from Turkey um, has a, a lot of their uh, people around the ground now in Tunisia helping Nahda to prepare for the elections. And they, look, they, they see their sort of practical experience in governing and electing and, and taking part in elections and in uh, guiding uh, Turkey through a period of uh, sustained economic growth. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a model, and so I think that they're, uh, to, I think we'll be on the sort of, in the Islamist circles, I think that they look, you know, to some degree they are world, but uh, especially to Turkey, and then within the more sort of uh, secular part of society, uh, natural to Europe, more than anywhere else to France, uh, there's been a bit of a backlash publicly against France uh, this year. Um, France was seen as having been the number one backer of the, the Ben Ali regime. Um, they were seen as uh, supporting him until the very end. Um, you know, as the protest uh, grew, the, the French foreign minister made some unwelcome comments about um, providing support to the Tunisian police to help put this down, uh, which actually led to the firing of the French foreign minister. Um, and so, as a result, even though you have sort of strong legacy and ties intellectually and academically to France, um, there's sort of a, a reluctance in many circles uh, to see, sort of be openly or publicly affiliated uh, with the French. And so there's, uh, which is strengthened sort of the position of some of the other European countries and also the United States. Um, just as a footnote, I was going to mention the Turkey model as well. I mean, just last month, Prime Minister Erdogan did a trip to Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya, and had this consistent message that you know Islam is not incompatible with democracy. We have a good model. We want to help. And I think it's it's in sort of broader terms, it's really you know Turkey. I think just kind of finally throwing in the towel on EU membership and, and looking south. So I think they, they really are probably the big, you know, kind of larger power to watch in terms of influence over the region. Well, I think in the general consensus is I think um, the, the reality in the ground is that mo most law professor and most constitutionalists in Tunisia are coming from the French system. And so I think it's a natural outcome to expect that um, there will be a heavy French influence uh, on sort of the future constitution. But I, I would agree with, with, with my colleagues that I think the, the general intention is to gain best practices as well from the Turkish model and, and frankly from this model in the United States as well. So, so that's why uh, the Tunisian constitutionalists are really trying to reach out to as a broader as uh, a forum as possible to sort of gain those best practices. The, the purpose is not to really draft the best constitution, uh, but you know, the best constitution will not make the country successful. But a bad constitution will 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 make it fail. Thank you very much. It'll be interesting to watch the tur Turkish connection, especially uh, back to you, Congressman. Thank you, Prime Minister Erdogan. Did he? I know he was in the in the area. Was he? Was he in Tunisia? And how was he, was he received? Well. Yeah, I think he was received particularly well in Tunisia and Libya. I think there was just a little bit more of a backlash in Egypt, where it was in the Muslim Brotherhood just came, just went pushed back and said, "Don't tell us how to, you know, how we should, you know, build our democratic system." But definitely Tunisia, he was well received. How's the how's the United States and President Obama seen in Tunisia? I think very favorably. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know what else to say beyond that, but I think I think quite I think quite favorably. I mean, I think. Um, you know, as as everyone said here, I mean, the you know Tunisians want to see a democratic system, and when people talk about a democratic system, you know, they do still look to us as the ultimate model. I, I think the, the administration and, and, and the president uh, are absolutely uh, seen favorably uh, in Tunisia. They have. Um, 
mean, obviously, sort of there's, there's been a rupture with uh, you know sort of the previous presidency, uh, which really uh, had a lot of trust deficit. Uh, but I think you know the what the Tunisian people are, are very um, you know uh, cognizant for is is the fact that the United States has moved very quickly in supporting the aspiration of the youth and has moved very quickly in supporting this revolution. Uh, in fact, uh, I think the first official who came to Tunisia uh, arrived on the 15th of January or the 16th of January uh, to Tunis. Uh, and uh, as he was walking out in the airport, leaving back to the United States, he saw the French delegation and the Italian delegation arriving. And so that, that, that says it all. In, in essence, you know, the US has had a much quicker reaction and a much more positive reaction towards supporting uh, the revolution. So, so the uh, the uh, the image of the U.S. is, is really at uh, I would say at all time highs. What if any elements of Al Qaeda are present in Tunisia? Well, there there is uh, you know certainly um, you know have been you know isolated security uh, issues uh, that sometimes have been traced to perhaps groups that are affiliated to Al Qaeda. But uh, there has been no presence, uh, frankly, of uh, Al Qaeda group or active groups in Tunisia, uh, probably due to a certain degree to the fact that security was one of the highest priority of the former regime, and that crackdowns after crackdowns, uh, you know, basically limited the uh, the possibilities. But um, fundamentally, I think the, the Tunisian people, uh, you know, through uh, sort of their differentiator, through the education, through the fact that. Frankly, the country has strong institution, has uh, you know a value proposition that is a bit different from other countries in the region. Uh, the, the, that growth, you know, or the seeds for that type of movement to grow in Tunisia was just not there. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody in the in the audience that would like to ask a question or make a comment of any sort whatsoever? Yes, sir. Uh, the microphones are on the end. Very, very Extreme in Whatever. Just one pointed out, I guess. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Ray. I'm a counselor at the Embassy of Tunisia here. I just wanted to um, add something about the uh, what the congressman asked. Um, you know about the clashes of religion. Just in Tunisia, we um, are mainly predominantly a Muslim population, about 98 percent, with 1 0.9 percent uh, Christians and 1.1 percent Jews. And just um, just I wanted to inform you that there is. Um, two Jewish Tunisians that are presenting themselves as head of lists during uh, these elections. One in Tunisia, in the island of Jerba. Uh, that island actually houses um, one of the oldest synagogues in the world. And <coughs> the guy who's presenting himself is um, the son of the president of that synagogue. And it's being viewed as, as I told you, this long standing heritage of, um, you know, um, acceptance of the other and peaceful coexistence of religions um, in Tunisia. Another comment I, would, uh, I wanted to make, just uh, Mohammed Ali now um, mentioned it, about the, um, I would say, the threat of extremism in Tunisia is, it's true what he said that, um, you know, in Tunisia, the make of the society, the moderation, the education, all the, but, there, are, there have been um, very serious uh, threats about you know, the revolution, what was going on in Libya, the smuggling of arms through the porous borders. So the, the actually, the security threats are, are there. So we um, would like to protect our borders as, you know, as much as we can. So um, just wanted to, the threat is, is minimal because we have a very vigilant army and a very vigilant um, you know, uh, security patrols. But you know the risk of, uh, of infiltration, especially with the um, uh, conflict in Libya, has been pretty serious, and, and we look forward to <coughs> more um, assistance with U.S. And, and other partners to secure our, our borders. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I understand your previous the previous government. The Senate wasn't as as active or powerful, but there was a Jewish member of the Senate, was there not? Yes. What, what what's the status of that gentleman? Is he is he still involved in politics, or was he part of the old regime and gone, or what? Well, I I, I have no information about um, as I mean, uh, is he still active in politics? But I know that he's the president of the Jewish community in, in Tunisia, and he's a well-respected figure 
among uh, the Jewish uh, community and the Tunisians, whether he wants to, you know, continue into politics or not. Yeah, that is, is, is personal. But but he lives safely, normally, as, as he used to. And then uh, this is just my own cultural uh, gap, I guess. You said Muhammad Ali, and I... Yeah, the, no, 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 because his name is Muhammad Ali. He's referred to as Muhammad here in the U.S., but in Tunisia we call him you know, his name is Muhammad Ali, so... Nobody calls him No, no, it's not the boxer. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you, you don't have to fear any punches from him. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, yeah, I was thinking of the discussion about mine just for places. You were talking about the issue of the veil and that whole problem, what they cover themselves with. And I was saying, it's, it's kind of an alien issue to some extent in America. You don't think about that. But it's certainly better than Boston. Scott Brown and Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> it's definitely a similar issue in a way, but it's a lot different. Uh, are there, if there are not any other questions, I want to thank all of our panelists for participating. And uh, I look forward to experiencing and learning more about uh, the whole process. I mean, I'm just fascinated. And one question I didn't ask, which I want, are there, are there voting machines there? Are you have voting machines or is it a paper ballot? Voting machines. And is there a paper trail? I mean, have y'all gotten to uh, Rush Holtz level yet, or where are we? Yeah, the, I think there will be a paper trail. And, and in fact, the, the election commission, they were a little bit late in this, but they did finally put out published polling place procedures, and they're pretty standard. And I think there have been, I mean, people should be able to, observers and party agents should be able to observe the count. They will post the results um, at the polling place. Do you know if there require photo IDs? And like we're going to start to do here in America? Well, I, you know, I think that's a good question. I don't know if the voter, if their voter registration cards have their picture on them. There's actually going to be a national identity card that's going to be um, uh, used. Um, obviously, if you if you registered, you can vote uh, pretty much where you registered. Uh, but if you haven't registered, which is the case of about roughly, I think, 35% or 40% of Tunisians, you can still register, you can still vote in the district where your identity card was issued. Something they've got that they don't have. Well, with no further questions, I want to thank everybody once again, and this hearing is uh, officially uh, adjourned. Thank you.